Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, welcome everybody to episode two of the Examine Life with Phil. Now, I'd originally planned something uh, very different for this week, but now what I'm going to talk about uh, seems very relevant and necessary as there was a mass shooting in California last week. So for this reason, I'm going to talk about the problem of evil and why we suffer. Now, in this uh, mass shooting, 12 people were killed, including a police officer who was trying to intervene and protect people, and a person who'd survived the mass shooting in Las Vegas last year also died, and the assailant or murderer died as well, and as usual, it looks like he killed himself before the police could get to, the, could get to him. In addition to this, there's currently a huge wildfire in California that's killed at least 48 people, and reports are that there are still 100 people missing. Pictures of it online look like something from a disaster or a sci-fi movie. People have compared the smoke from it to a mushroom cloud. And also in the last week, a girl I went to college with posted an an obituary on Facebook for her two-year-old daughter. Sometimes when I hear people complain about certain types of evil and suffering in the world, I, I really just want to tell them to grow up because they're being petty and small, like when their coffee didn't turn out the way they want, or when I get frustrated because my kids aren't behaving the way I want them to. If I conclude from that that there's a issue with the problem of evil, there's probably something wrong with me. But that doesn't at all extend to a two-year-old little girl dying. There's something horrifically wrong with that, and we all see that. Stan Lee also died this last week, but he was 95 and had lived a long and, by most accounts, pretty full, good life. So it just doesn't punch you in the gut quite the same way when you hear that Stan Lee died at 95 like it does to hear that a two-year-old little girl died. So my quick point here is that when someone wants to complain about something like Walmart running out of the particular item that was on sale, making them doubt that a good God exists, I just want to tell them they're being childish. But if that girl's mother said that the fact that her daughter died at two years old gave her a hard time believing in a good God, well, I'm much more sympathetic to that, and I think most of us should be. We just instinctively know that that little girl should have lived in 95 like Stanley did, and there's something horrifically wrong with the fact that she died so young. So, what should we do about suffering and evil? This is easily one of the most fundamental questions about life, And if you listened to my episode last week, you'll know it's one of the things that dragged me into philosophy. So I've thought about this a lot. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, a glass of whiskey, or whatever it is that you drink when you're dealing with hard existential problems, and let's go through it. Maybe you could put the whiskey and the coffee together. That often works pretty well. When he was writing about pain, C.S. Lewis said, The only purpose of the book is to solve the intellectual problem raised by suffering. For the far higher task of teaching fortitude and patience, I was never fool enough to suppose myself qualified, nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be borne, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the least tintiker of the love of God more than all. Uh, He was British a long time ago. We don't really use the word tintiker anymore, but you get the idea. Now, I genuinely believe that some very good and helpful work has been done on evil and suffering by some very intelligent philosophers and theologians. But unfortunately, most of this work seems to have been written in highly academic ways that make it very difficult for the average person to read and understand. It most certainly should not require a graduate degree to understand why God allows people to suffer. So likewise, any attempt to understand and explain evil that cannot be understood by pretty much everyone at a basic level doesn't really amount to much of an explanation. I don't say this to denigrate highly academic philosophers and theologians who think about and deal with evil and suffering. I firmly enjoy and get a lot of benefit out of reading their work, but most people don't. My point here is that a good answer that is understood by very few isn't practically much different from no answer at all. And there's a great hunger for the answers and reasons to be given to questions like why we suffer. The failure of the church in general to communicate good answers to this has led to things like the uh, heretical book The Shack, and that book attempts to answer the problem of evil by redefining who and what God is so that he's no longer the God of Orthodox Christianity, but something else entirely. 
In order to talk about this problem of evil rationally, it's necessary for me to define some terms, explain a couple of things, and make a few distinctions. So, I apologize in advance if I'm going over things you already know. I'm certainly not trying to insult your intelligence, but it's just necessary that you understand the terms and distinctions before I can make any good explanations or insights. We have to do the hard and sometimes boring work of cooking the food before we can enjoy the experience of eating it. Likewise, a great deal of groundwork needs to be done before we can do anything useful about the problem of evil. Now, in a strictly philosophical sense, the problem of evil is a formal argument, and nearly all serious attempts to overcome it have also been formal arguments. I'll go over some less strictly philosophical senses of the problem a little later. Please note that as I am approaching this philosophically, some aspects of this might come across as rude or callous to someone who is currently going through a great amount of suffering. I'll, um, much later on, I'll try and deal with it in ways that are a little bit more practical. So what's the nature of logical arguments? Well, a logical argument is just an attempt to use reason to bring us to from a premise to a conclusion by showing that if the premise or premises are true, the conclusion is also true, i.e., if A is true, then B must be true. So a simple argument is, one, all cats are evil, two, Steve is a cat, three, therefore Steve is evil. In this case, if we know that one and two are true, then we can also know that three is true. Now the above is a deductive argument. That means the conclusions must necessarily follow if the premises are true. There are also inductive arguments. In an inductive argument, the conclusion is likely true, or more likely than not, if the premises are true. So an inductive argument is something like this. One, most cats are evil. Two, Steve is a cat. So, three, Steve is most likely evil. Here the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow. It's possible that Steve is an evil. But because most cats are evil and Steve is a cat, it is more than likely true that Steve is evil. It's more probable than not. Now, most of the reasoning we all do in our daily lives is inductive reasoning like this. We talk and think about what is more likely than not far more often than we are able to look at things deductively. So, there are three possible ways to object to any deductive argument. So, there are three categories of theodicies. A theodicy is a proposed answer to the problem of evil. So, the way we could respond to a deductive argument is by going after the terms, the propositions, or the logic. So, for example, take a different argument. One, all cats like to sit on mats. Two, Steve is a cat. Three, so Steve will enjoy sitting on my friend, Matt. Now, if a term is being used in a vague, disingenuous, or ambiguous way, the argument probably fails. In the above argument, Matt is being used disingenuously, as in one, it's a piece of cloth placed on the ground, and in three, it means a person. This can also occur if a term is too vague or loosely defined. When the weather is bad, Steve is upset. Pardon me, that's number one. Two, it's raining. Three, so Steve is upset. Now, since one doesn't clearly define what is meant by bad weather, you know, some people actually like being in the rain, then this argument also fails. Now, the second way to respond to an argument is to show that a premise is false. So with the first argument, if we can demonstrate that not all cats are evil, then that would knock the argument down just flat. Find a cat who's pleasant and agreeable and you'll prove the argument false. As uh, Peter Kreef says, I can prove anything with false premises. Although, you're going to have a very hard time finding a cat that's pleasant and agreeable. I'm pretty convinced that those don't exist. And finally, we can show that an argument is using bad logic. That simply means the conclusion does not follow from the premises. It's a non sequitur, it uses two particular premises, or there's some other type of logical fallacy going on. There's uh, many different kinds of logical fallacies. You can find examples of them on the internet pretty readily. There's one that's uh, there's a good meme that goes around called the Ten Commandments of Logic, where it says, Thou shalt not, and lists all of them. It's pretty funny. Now, there's no logical error in the original argument I gave about cats being evil, but I can state it differently to make it invalid and show this. One, all cats are evil. Two, Steve is evil. Three, so Steve is a cat. Now, this is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. It says, if A, then B, B, so A. The argument is obviously wrong because not all evil things are cats. There are plenty of evil things in the world that are not cats. 
but unfortunately it's not always so obvious when bad logic is being used. Sometimes this can be pretty hard to recognize. Now, this little lesson in formal arguments can is actually leading us to an important point here. Now, Steve the cat can be evil even if all the arguments we can think of actually fail, if they're all bad arguments. And what this demonstrates is a simple but very helpful fact of the matter. Bad and invalid arguments do not show the falsity of their premises or conclusions. A bad argument for Steve being evil, or being a cat, does not prove that Steve is not evil, or a cat. The first argument I gave above is quite valid, and I think may be sound, although some people will argue against that, and it establishes, assuming the truth of the premises, that Steve is evil. It doesn't matter how many bad arguments we could dream up, or how many times I could give arguments that affirm the consequent to show this. Steve is evil based on that argument. Now, this is relevant to what I'm doing here, because what this demonstrates is that bad theodicies, or arguments for explaining why God allows evil, don't establish that God has no reason, is unjustified in allowing evil, or that he's evil himself. It means those reasons and arguments are bad, and nothing else. If there is one really good and sound argument that God should allow evil, then it doesn't matter if there are millions of bad ones. So when foolish but well-meaning people in church have told me, you just need to trust God, he has reasons for letting you suffer, that doesn't mean that God doesn't actually have reasons. It only means that they didn't give me any good reasons to trust God or think that God has reasons there. There might be good reasons to trust God, and God could still have good reasons for letting people suffer. I just don't know them on what those people have told me. So further, when people in the church or elsewhere or philosophers have claimed, no theodicies work, so no God exists, they're making an unwarranted claim there. This means that when the famous philosopher Bertrand Russell said, quote, no one can believe in a good God if they've sat at the bedside of a dying child, he was making an unwarranted claim, and I'll explain further here. Warrant is a term that philosophers and epistemologists, the people who study how and why knowledge exists and how things are known, it's what they use to talk about people who are and are not justified in knowing and claiming to know. It's actually a very simple concept that they tend to make a bit needlessly complicated. If you've ever said to anyone, you can't know that, you were in effect saying to them, you don't have warrant for believing that. So it's really a pretty simple concept. If I say, my car stopped running, therefore the U.S. government must have sabotaged it, I'm making an unwarranted claim. I don't have good reason to think the government sabotaged my car, so it's unwarranted. There are lots of other reasons why my car could have stopped running. Maybe it ran out of gas. Maybe it has mechanical problems. Perhaps someone other than the government sabotaged it. Unless I have some evidence that the government did sabotage my car, like, say, video of an FBI agent opening the hood, I'm not justified in claiming they did. I do not have a rational or reasonable basis for concluding it's true. When I don't have any evidence that points me in the direction of the government sabotaging my car, I'm not warranted in making that claim. And further, I do have a little ev evidence that points in the other direction. I have my background knowledge of how cars work and what the U.S. government typically does. I know the government doesn't typically go around sabotaging cars of ordinary citizens, and I know that most of the time when cars are broken down, the government hasn't really had anything to do with it. This background knowledge makes that original claim even more unwarranted because it points me in the other direction. Now, it's still broadly logically possible that the government did sabotage my car as this idea is not a contradiction or an incoherent thought. But it's not something that I have any amount of evidence in favor of, and I have some background knowledge that points me away from that. So the claim's unwarranted, and I'd be foolish to make it. Now, let's return to Bertrand Russell. Assume that he actually did sit at the bedside of a dying child. It was probably just a thought experiment, but I don't know, maybe he actually did. But let's make this even harder and assume that the child was dying from an extremely painful disease for which there was no treatment or relief. And still make it worse, this child contracted this disease through no fault of his own, but through the direct actions of others. Let's say the poor kid's mother was an intravenous drug user when she was pregnant. Now, this is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, you'd have to be a heartless monster to not be asking why and be at least tempted to weep over this heinous and grotesque suffering. So let's suppose that Bertrand Russell is there at the child's bed, 
and every sweet, sappy, and dumb saying that Christians sometimes give about God's purposes fail them, and just the same, every well-reasoned and thought-out theodicy fails. Since Russell was an atheist, I think we can just assume he did not find any theodicy convincing. He is there, and he has no idea this, why this is happening, no framework to approach it, and let's make it a little worse even, there is no one else around to help or support him as a child. Given all this, is Bertrand Russell warranted in claiming that there is no good God? No, he's not. Not if the logic of these formal arguments is correct. He's no more warranted in making that claim than I was in claiming the government sabotaged my car. Now, of course, this feels bad, because it is bad, but even if we assume from the get-go that we just don't have any good arguments or reasons to explain how this happened, it doesn't follow that there are none. It only follows that we haven't seen them. Now, this doesn't show that such a child dying is a good or morally neutral thing. Of course it's not. It's horrible. It only shows that a human person is not warranted in taking the fact of an instance of evil and therefore concluding that there is no God. Technically stated, you cannot prove a positive claim, like there is or is not something, from the negation or failure of arguments. So you cannot say there is or is not X from arguments for X fail. So when my fellow Christians say things like, evolution doesn't work, so God made everything, they are also making an unwarranted claim. It does not follow from evolution not working that God did anything. Perhaps there's something other than God and or evolution that did or could have done something. Proving evolution doesn't work would negate the claim that evolution produced life, the world, and all the species we see on Earth, but it really doesn't prove anything else. Knocking down evolutionary theory, that is, negating, defeating the argument, does not prove that God made the world, a positive claim. I do think there are good reasons to claim God made everything, but showing evolution doesn't work isn't one of them. Likewise, when Russell claimed that because children die, there is no good God, he too was making an unwarranted claim. God's non-existence, or perhaps God's lack of virtue, does not follow from the failure of theodicies. If I do not understand why Steve the cat does something, does it follow that Steve has no reasons for what he does? Well, no, it doesn't. So when we don't know any of the good reasons why God allows people to suffer, and why he heals some people and not others, and when every reason and argument we know of fails, it doesn't follow that God has no reasons or purposes. It simply follows that we don't know what those reasons and purposes are. There could be some that we're unaware of. A human being is never in an epistemic position where he or she can be warranted in saying that God has no reasons or purposes. No one who is a human can have that much knowledge. God can have, and given what the arguments above demonstrates, it's likely he does, he could have reasons and purposes that we don't know and maybe can't comprehend. In fact, I would go so far as to say that any God worth being called God is going to have reasons, purposes, and ways that are just simply above human conception. If we could conceive of everything that God can conceive, then we would be God. Now, this is actually uh, the insight that Alvin Plantinga offered in his uh, free will defense that he argued for in his book, God, Freedom, and Evil. What he did there was demonstrate that the logical problem of evil is unsound and that it, and that it doesn't work. He argued that God cannot be thought of as being able to do anything because there are some things that are not really things. They're incoherent. These are things like square circles, married bachelors, um, Democrats and Republicans who actually apply the principle of charity to each other, you know, things like that that are just impossible. What Plantinga demonstrated is that it's such an incoherence to have people who have free will but never choose to do evil. Thus, if God wants us to have free will, he will need to allow for the fact that we will behave badly and do evil. This, these two just necessarily go together like the two sides of a coin, and that's what Plantinga's argument demonstrates. Now, Plantinga's argument was so good that it effectively killed the logical problem of evil in academic philosophy. Almost no one actually uses the logical problem of evil in philosophy of religion anymore because Plantinga destroyed it. So when you ever hear somebody claiming, oh, philosophy never advances, we never learn anything, well, that's not true. This is a pretty substantial advancement in just the last 50 years. The logical problem of evil was argued about for thousands, oh, maybe even upwards of 2,000 years, and then in the last 50 years, Plantinga just knocked it down, and now everyone argues about the evidential problem of evil, which is a very different thing. 
Now, fortunately, this appeal to our lack of knowledge doesn't end things, because the limits of our knowledge are not at an end here. There is a problem in how we often approach questions of suffering and evil, in that we're always looking for one ultimate answer, and that's ultimate with a capital U. We just want to know something that explains everything all at once. Now, it seems that pretty much every explanation, defense, or theodicy that can be given for why we suffer and why there's evil fails to completely explain the problem. Well, a lot of evil can be explained by the existence of free will, that is, people making free choices for good or evil, that doesn't really explain things like earthquakes and hurricanes. And it's also certainly true that evil and suffering can sometimes produce great good. This is called the uh, soul-making theodicy, and it's the theme of the story of Joseph in Genesis. Sometimes this good might even be good enough to outweigh and justify the evil that preceded it, but it's really quite easy to point out examples of evil where it seems to do no good, where it seems like nothing good is produced, or that the good produced pales in comparison to the horrific evil that caused it. Now, what I'm getting at here is that ultimately all of these various theodicies fail to explain at least some instances of evil. The existence of free will can explain, and perhaps justify, why I've treated some people cruelly in my life, but it can't really explain why it was necessary for a tsunami to kill a quarter of a million people back in 2004. The suffering caused by a knife cutting through flesh can easily be justified if it's a doctor using the knife to perform surgery, but it's difficult to see how any good for anyone is produced by the rape and murder of a child. The problem with the way this is being framed is that it just assumes that there's one final answer to why evil exists, and I'm really unable to find any reason to justify this assumption. Why does there need to be one, ultimate with a capital U, final answer to why everything that's evil exists? Multiple answers and explanations are acceptable in other areas of knowledge, and we all accept multiple answers and reasons in every other part of our lives. To illustrate, let's consider a completely different question. If I ask, why does a car drive? Numerous different answers that are all true can be given. A car drives due to the processes of an internal combustion engine. A car drives because it has wheels. A car is able to drive due to certain characteristics of the laws of physics like fiction, gravity, and chemical combustion, that is fire. A car is also able to drive because I'm sitting behind the wheel directing it where to go. Now all these answers are true. There are also lots of other answers to the question that would be true, like my car drives because it has gas, my car drives because I take it to a good mechanic, and so on. None of these answers in and of themselves completely explains the phenomena of a car driving. They only explain certain parts and characteristics of that phenomena, and that's perfectly fine. We don't need to totally and completely understand everything that is occurring as the car drives to realize that, say, the reason it stopped running is that it ran out of gas. The point is that no one, not even the engineers who designed it, ever totally and completely understands everything that's happening all at once as the car drives. Even if such knowledge were possible, most of that information would be just totally useless and irrelevant to any normal person. No one is seeking to understand car driving in to this total and absolute sense. Why would anyone ever need such knowledge. All we really need is an adequate knowledge of how and why the car drives. I need some knowledge of it in order to understand how to drive it, repair it, maintain it, and make sensible use out of it. Do I really need to know the exact atomic content of the metal in the bolts in the car's frame to make sensible use out of it and have it get me where I want to go? Well, no, of course not. Now, no one looks at this reality and will say, all attempts to explain the driving of a car fail at some level because they all either leave some questions unanswered or these explanations seem to contradict each other. We would call any person who claims such a thing foolish and be quite right to do so. The fact that a car drives due to the process of internal combustion, the reality that I'm driving it, and the intention of the engineers who designed it does not mean that one of these three answers is wrong or that they contradict each other. Anyone who thinks that is being really foolish. And yet, that's exactly what we seem to do in regards to evil and suffering. People say things like, The Bible claims that some evil and suffering is a result of the consequences of sin, yet there are clear examples in the Bible where people suffer as a direct result of doing the right thing, so that the Odyssey fails. Or, you can explain a lot of evil by the existence of free will requiring the existence of some evil, 
but there are plainly examples of evil and suffering that were not caused by anyone making any choice, so that's the Odyssey fails. Or, some examples of suffering can produce a greater good, but there are clear examples of evil that can never be justified in this way, so that the Odyssey fails. And so on and so forth they'll go. Now, the agnostic biblical scholar uh, Bart Ehrman actually wrote a whole book on Scripture's approach to evil and how he thinks it fails to give any good answers. In the introduction of this book, he listed four reasons he wrote the book, two of which are relevant here. Ehrman asserts the Bible contained many and varied answers to the problem of evil and why there is suffering in the world, and many of these answers are at odds with each other and at odds with what people seem to think today. Now, he's quite correct that Scripture actually gives multiple reasons why evil exists, but he seems to believe that having multiple explanations for the same phenomena is somehow a problem and I just can't for the life of me understand why he thinks this is so. As we saw above, it isn't a problem when we're explaining how a car drives. It isn't a problem in other areas of life and other disciplines of knowledge. Well, and to be fair to Ehrman, he does say that some of the theodicy scripture gifts contradict each other, and if that's true, it should give us some pause. Actual contradictions are a sign of falsity, just as coherence is a sign of truth. But as far as I'm aware, the numerous responses Scripture gives to evil do not contradict each other unless you assume that each one of these is not meant as an ultimate answer, the ultimate with the capital U, where that answer is given with the intention of excluding all other answers. As long as you don't assume that the different answers and approaches Scripture gives to evil are exhaustive, then there just is no problem. Now, Ehrman does seem to assume this, but I don't really see any reason we should do so. Just as with car driving, there is no reason to think having multiple explanations of evil equals no good explanations of evil. I read no place in scripture where it says, this is the final ultimate answer to evil at all times, in everywhere, and in every sense. Rather, scripture seems to take a much more reserved and nuanced approach by saying why bad things happened in this certain case, why they happened in this certain case, but generally not seeming to say much more than that. So, nearly all theodicies are capable of explaining or justifying some evil, but not all of it. But what cannot be explained by, say, the soul-making theodicy? Well, that sometimes could be explained by the free will theodicy. What cannot be explained by if these theodicies might be explained by a third one, and so on and so forth. So just as the phenomena of a car driving is not fully explained by only the physical or the teleological, teleological means purpose, that is, the person inside driving the car, then neither is evil fully explained by a single theodicy. But might evil be fully explained by multiple theodicies working together? Well, here I say, you know, perhaps. Depending on how nuanced, specific, and introspective we are about car driving, at some level we even fail to completely understand that, and that's if it's pushed out to things like theoretical physics, string theory, and so on. But again, you know, if someone were to argue that string theory shows a fundamental problem with the reality that I'm driving a car, we'd really question his intelligence and be quite right to do so. So, I doubt that people will ever be able to completely understand everything about the physical construction of the universe and reality, and I also doubt we'll ever be able to completely understand evil. But, just as the vastness and complexity of the physical universe doesn't cause physicists to just throw up their hands and proclaim in frustration, I can never understand it all! Why bother trying? Neither should the reality that we probably can't completely understand evil cause us to proclaim that the problem is insurmountable and give up. So, as it's possible to understand physics at a functional and practical level, the fact that I'm speaking into a microphone, into a computer that's going to be transmitted over the internet, really indicates that we can make good use of physics without a complete and fully objective understanding of it. So it's possible for us to understand evil at a practical level that will enable us and help us to cope with it and address it in our lives and the lives of others. I think it probably is practically impossible for us to completely understand everything about evil and God's purposes, but we can certainly make at least some sense out of it. So now here's a question. What actually is evil? And this is a very important question that we should ask in reference to this. And this is not asking whether or not certain acts like murdering puppies, making baby rabbits cry, or deleting your roommate's save game files that he spent 50 hours on. It's not asking whether or not those acts are evil, but what is evil in and of itself? And this is actually a very difficult question to answer. 
every morally sane person will agree that certain acts are evil and certain acts are good, and we more, with some exceptions, we actually line up on the majority of that. But the attempt to define what is the actual essence of evil, and most of us, most of us come up dry on that. Just for example here, the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy says that an event may be called evil if it involves at least one of the following six things. One, some harm, whether it be minor or great, being done to the physical and or psychological well-being of a sentient creature. Two, the unjust treatment of some sentient creature. Three, the loss of opportunity resulting from premature death. Four, anything that prevents an individual from leading a fulfilling and virtuous life. Five, a person doing what is morally wrong. And six, the privation of good. Now, this academic philosophy site has a hard time giving a fixed definition of evil. Notice how all these criteria apply to something outside of themselves. Who or what defines what harm is in number one? How do we define what is unjust in number two? What does and does not constitute an opportunity in number three? Who decides what is a fulfilling and virtuous life in number four? How do we determine what is morally wrong or good in five and six? So while I, and every other morally sane person, I'm in general agreement with those above criteria, they don't give us a fixed definition that we're looking for. They don't get at the essence of evil. Now, what I mean here by fixed definition is it's something that we can define in and of itself. For example, uh, a table has a pretty fixed definition as it's an object with a flat surface and legs that support that surface. You can point to a table and say, there it is, take a look. And you need not refer to anything else other than that table to define it. That's why I mean by saying a table has a fixed definition. Now, conversely, to define evil, it seems we need to refer to things other than evil. Hence, evil doesn't seem to have this fixed definition, and that makes it very hard to properly and completely define it. This is why many attempts to define evil actually become circular. For example, question, why is an act evil? Answer, it hurts someone. Well, why shouldn't I hurt people? Because it's evil to hurt people. But why is it evil to hurt people? Because hurting people produces obvious negative effects like pain and suffering. Well, why are pain and suffering bad? Because they're unpleasant, and so on and so forth. We could continue this questioning on for quite some time and still might not get anywhere. It's like what Augustine said about time. That is, we all seem to kind of know what evil is until we're asked to define it, and then we uh, run into problems. And the point here is, we really aren't exactly sure what the exact nature of evil is. We don't really understand what its essence is. We can say some things about it that are definitely true, like murdering baby rabbits because I like to hear them scream is evil, and a few things that are about it that are definitely false, like, say, feeding baby rabbits is evil, but we do not know exactly what evil is. And one possible reason for this that I've been giving some thought to is some people have said that evil, what evil is is it's the opposite of being, that is being with a capital B. And here, being is an ontological and metaphysical term, and the easiest way to understand it here is, think of God as being with a capital B. And now everything that's not God, that's below him, has some being with a small b. So, like, a rock would have some being, but I've got more being than a rock because I'm more like God than a rock is. You know, I'm sentient, I can think, I can reason. A rock can't do any of those things. Now, my dog isn't really sentient, but, well, maybe he is, but he's got consciousness, but he can't really reason and doesn't really have the same mental capacities as I do. At least I hope I've got a few more than he does. So he would have more being than the rock, but less than me. And so this idea here is that what evil is, is it's the absence or the opposite of being like that. And there might be, I think there might be something to this, because that would actually explain why it's so hard to give a fixed definition for it, why it seems that evil has no essence, because it would be the opposite of actually having an essence. Having an essence or a core or something like that, something that is that fixed definition I'm looking for, that's actually a good thing in many senses. So it would make sense that evil wouldn't have that, because evil's not good. Augustine actually gave a theodicy that's very similar to this, and the analogy would go like this, that there is no such thing as dark, as dark has no essence, it's just the absence of light. And so therefore we would say that 
there's actually no evil, it's just simply the absence of good. And in some ways, as I said, this is kind of an appealing idea. It avoids the problem of circular definitions, and it gives its own theodicy, which goes like this. One, God created good. Two, some people, moral agents, reject good. Three, all evil is created by the rejection or absence of good. Four, therefore God is not responsible for evil. And this is a, actually a pretty sensible and reasonable theodicy. Um, the trouble I see with it is in three, in that it, I don't think it's always so clear that all evil is always created by the rejection or absence of good. The trouble I run into here is that it seems that just a lack of goodness is kind of inadequate for explaining some instances of evil. For example, a lack of goodness could easily explain why, say, I walk by somebody on the street who needs my help, but I don't help them. That's an evil that's very easily explainable by a lack of goodness in me. But suppose instead in that story I decide I'm going to just beat the person to death with my bare hands. And, you know, that's, that's horrifically evil. That's horrible. Well, it seems like there's something more required than just a lack of goodness to get me to that point, which it makes me suspect that maybe there's more going on than just evil being a lack of good. But still, it's a reasonable theory that Augustine has uh, advanced and many other people have advanced, and there might be something to it. But nonetheless, even if we do accept this idea that evil's the absence of good, then it's something we can't really define, so at least in some sense it's going to remain unknown. So if we're not exactly sure what evil is, how can we expect to explain or answer it completely with one answer? Now this is plainly a foolish idea, yet it's often what we expect these theodicies and these answers that people give us about why evil to do. How can we possibly expect to completely explain something when we don't know exactly what it is? So here's an analogy from basic algebra. We let x stand for an unknown thing, and algebra is an unknown quantity. We do not know the exact nature of x, but we do know a few things with x about certainty. Let's say in this case we know that x is greater than 2, we know that x is not 3, and we know that x is not 10. Now, given the limited knowledge we have about x, could we solve the equation 2 plus x equals y for y? Of course we can't. Unless we're given some more information about x, or y, we just have no way of knowing what y is in that equation. We could say a few things that are certainly true, like we know that y is not 3, 4, or 5, we know that y is not 12, but we cannot really solve the equation. We simply don't have enough information about what x is to do that. Now look at the analogy again and think of x as standing for evil and y as standing for the answer to evil. If we're not exactly sure what evil really is, then how can we posit an answer to it? So until we know exactly what evil is, we cannot expect to posit a complete solution or explanation for it. I very much doubt that anyone in this life will ever be able to explain exactly what evil is. So I guess that's it. There's really uh, nothing more to say. Evil is there, or maybe out there, or maybe both here, there, and out there, but there isn't anything we can do about it. Well, no, not, no, not, not really. Look at that math example again. Just because the exact nature of x is unknown doesn't mean that we cannot use the equation at all. We can use the equation to determine that y is not 3, 4, 5, or 12. We can determine that if x is equal to 4, y is equal to 6. We can determine that if y is equal to 5, x is equal to 3. x having an unknown quantity here doesn't mean that there is nothing true and useful we can know. Suppose all we wanted to know is if it is possible that y is equal to 1. Assuming that we're not using any negative or unreal numbers, we can answer that question with certainty. So, at this time, I don't think I or anyone else can give a complete answer to the problem of evil, and it's doubtful we'll ever be able to, and I'm deeply suspicious of anyone who claims they have. As the British scholar and theologian N.T. Wright said, anyone who claims to have solved the problem of evil doesn't understand the problem of evil. But this doesn't actually invalidate theodicies, it just simply limits them. Each theodicy represents a part of what we can say about the problem of evil. None of them completely answers it, and it's doubtful that all of them together could completely answer it. But stack all the theodicies together and we can say some very good and useful things about evil. We cannot explain it all, but we can understand it and help make some sense of it. And this brings us to the how and why distinction.
A big problem I have observed with philosophy and theology on the problem of evil is a failure to distinguish between the how and why question. I often hear people ask, why did God allow this evil to happen to me? Foolish but well-meaning philosophers have responded, well, God had to allow that evil because to counter it would require that he undermine free will. Now these people were asking why, and the philosophers responded with how. No wonder the answer feels unsatisfactory. It's logically valid, but it doesn't answer the actual question being asked. Almost everything I've said up to now is really an answer to the how of evil, not the why. This mistake is akin to me asking why my friend David is driving a car and being told, well, a long time ago a man named Ford developed this thing called an assembly line. After that, one thing led to another and now David is driving a car. I was looking for an answer of why, more like, He's running from the cops because they want to arrest him for smoking in a public area. Here I'm assuming David is from Springfield, Missouri, where there's a public smoking ban. I was asking a why question and got a how answer. How is quite distinct from why. Now, I've, a lot of theology and philosophy I've read on evil just completely fails to recognize this distinction. Here's another example to help explain. When I move my arm, we can talk about the processes that make this happen. We could discuss the interaction of the muscles, tendons, and bones in my arm. We could talk about the working of the cells that make up those things, or the chemical reactions that those cells use to function. There are a whole lot of different things at many levels to look at here. But all these things are the how of me moving my arm. The why of me moving my arm is, I wanted to pick up and drink a cup of coffee. Now. The why is enabled by the how. Without the how, the why probably can't exist. But these two things are distinct. Why is a question of purpose, and how is a question of process. So why is it that so many intelligent and well-meaning people who are educated philosophers and theologians just fail to make this distinction? Well, I, I don't really know. That's a hard. It's hard to say exactly. Uh, perhaps part of it is that it's just a whole lot easier to answer how questions than it is to answer why questions. A how question is a statement of objective fact, or at least it's an attempt to make a statement of objective fact. It's a lot easier to answer questions about objective facts than it is to answer questions about purpose. Purpose or why questions are much trickier and much more subjective. And why is this? Well, how answers are definite and defined. We can be certain or at least somewhat certain of the truth or falsity of a how question. But it's very difficult to have any sense of certainty about why questions. A fact that affects someone for good may also affect another person for evil. Suppose I go broke and then I have to sell off all my books at low prices to help provide for my family. Now this is a bad thing for me, but it's a very good person for the people who buy all my books. Or if a soldier leaps on an IED, an improvised explosive device, to save his friends, in many senses that's very bad for him because he's going to die or be mortally wounded or maybe lose his limbs but it's a very good thing for his friends that he saved. So I think the primary reason why many philosophers and theologians are more comfortable with how answers is we can and do know them with a pretty high level of certainty. But it's very, very hard to know why answers. However, it's not impossible to know the whys of things. The story of Joseph in Genesis illustrates a case where we really do know why. Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers and then was repeatedly mistreated and suffered for doing the right thing. At the end of his story, Joseph tells his brothers that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. God had ensured Joseph would be in Egypt to save food and feed everyone when the famine came. Through the evil actions of Joseph's brothers, God preserved the lives of Joseph, his brothers, and countless, countless other people. Here we do know why Joseph suffered the evil. The Bible literally tells us why. And even though God brought a greater good from the evil Joseph suffered, it was still evil what Joseph endured. God didn't undo or unmake the evil, rather he twisted it and used the evil for his own good purposes. But most of the time, we really don't know why. We can guess, and we can make some guesses that are highly probable and rule out some other ones that are highly unlikely. Remember that the math example above demonstrates that we can still say useful things that are true about topics that have unknowns. I think in the example of, so, say, me being forced to sell my books, it's highly unlikely that would happen so that starving children somewhere could be fed.
but maybe it would happen due to my own irresponsible actions that caused me to go broke. I think this distinction here is the major reason why so many people find theodicies and explanations for suffering so unsatisfying. We want to know why. We want to know the purpose behind it. But nearly all the theodicies simply tell us how. Why answers are what nearly everyone wants to know when we ask God why God healed this person and not that one. Why God heals one person from their migraine headaches but lets me suffer for them. Or why one woman's baby dies while she is giving birth while others live. We want to know that there's some purpose and meaning behind it all. It's a little bit like what Nietzsche said, He who has a why to live can bear almost any how. But the trouble is that the why is very, very hard to know, and while the how isn't always easy to find, it's usually possible to get a pretty good idea of the how. So, I can cite and quote a great number of theodicies that explain why God's existence is incompatible with the existence of evil, and some of them are really good, like Alvin Plantinga's free will defense. But... The free will defense is a how answer, not a why answer. It's attempting to explain the way God set up and organized the universe, much akin to how the laws of physics describe the universe. So even though I could cite and explain a lot of different theodicies, and many of them are quite sensible and reasonable, they're probably not the answer that most people are looking for. So now at last we come to the answer. Well, kind of. See, now that all this groundwork has been laid and we've discussed so many of these distinctions and issues, I can start attempting to give some explanations and answers. So, why does God allow suffering? I think there are all kinds of different reasons depending on what particular incident of suffering we are talking about. I know that in my own life, some of the suffering I've endured has made me a better man of more Christ-like character. Sometimes I've suffered due to the evil and sinful actions of other people, and usually those people didn't understand what they were doing. Sometimes I've simply been on the wrong end of certain physical laws. You know, it really hurts when a brown recluse spider bites you. And sometimes I've suffered due to my own foolish and sinful choices. Now, notice in the explanations that I offer of my own suffering, there's a mix of how and why answers. Since, as I talked about earlier, the why is enabled by the how, this should be expected to some degree. We can probably never, in this universe, have a why without a how. So we can say for certain that in each instance of suffering, there will be a how answer, and usually we can understand the how pretty well. We can usually have a pretty good understanding of the physics and medical facts involved when someone dies due to injuries in a car crash. Or, for example, in the California wildfires, we have a pretty good sense of part of how that happened is that it's, they've had a horrific drought there, and that, so that's made them more susceptible to that. Or in the case of mass shootings, uh, one part of the how is the vast majority of these, I think it's like 95 or 98 percent, occur in gun-free zones. And it's good to know these how questions because that'll enable us to do things that minimize suffering. We probably can't do anything about droughts causing wildfires, but we can do a lot of th things with how answers to like medical issues, maybe some political ones and things like that, where we can look and say, oh, this suffering is happening because of this, and we can deal with it. So even though we usually want why answers, the how answers are far from irrelevant or unuseful. It's by them that we do things like advanced science and figure out how to minimize and even do away with a whole lot of suffering in the world. A lot of people used to die of malaria, and because we got a how answer as to how malaria came about through mosquitoes, that doesn't happen as often anymore. So I think I know, or at least have a pretty good idea, of some of the why answers to my own suffering but that's generally because I only have the benefit of hindsight. I suffered for trying to persevere and do the right thing while I was in the military, and it was almost as a direct result of that that I got into doing philosophy. I wanted to know why these things had happened to me, and that caused me to start looking for answers. God used this to install a love of truth and knowledge in me that has led me to where I am now. In many senses, God used the evil that had been done to me and twisted it by using it to enable a good in my life that I probably otherwise would not have gotten. If that hadn't happened to me, I probably wouldn't be speaking in this podcast right now. I just wouldn't be in a position where I could say these things if I hadn't had that evil done to me in the past. I think this makes the suffering I had to endure more than worth it. But that is my own subjective judgment. I find the same is true of nearly all the suffering that I have endured, in that God is really in the habit of taking what was intended for evil and using it for good.
So, since God has proven that he knows what he is doing, when I find myself suffering again, it only makes sense for me to trust him that he still knows what he's doing, even though I'm suffering. The point here is that if we let him, what the Christian God does is do a kind of jujitsu move on evil, in that he takes what was evil and uses it to make and enable something good that couldn't have existed without that evil being done. I never would have started studying philosophy or met my wife if not for the evil that was done to me. And we see the same pattern in scripture. In John 9, Christ and the disciples meet a man who was born blind. The disciples ask why he was born blind, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Christ tells them that no one sinned, but that the man was born blind so that God's glory could be shown through him. Then Christ heals the man, and he witnesses for Christ, who he still hasn't physically seen, before the hostile Pharisees. Now the Pharisees had repeatedly shown that they had no interest in following Christ or listening to his message, as they were for the most part too wrapped up in their own self-righteousness. But God, being God, still wanted to give them a chance, so he literally performed it a miracle and used it as an object lesson, where the man who was until recently physically blind, and he still didn't actually see Christ until after he witnessed for Christ, actually sees what is going on better than the self-righteous fl- Pharisees who can physically see. The blind person sees better than those who are not. Christ actually says as much of this at the end of that chapter. So here Christ took an instance of suffering and used it for good by healing the man and using the suffering he had endured to advance the kingdom of God. And this wouldn't have been possible had the man not been born blind. We see this very thing as well in Christ's own death. Christ's death can be called the most horrific and evil event in history, as we, humanity, literally killed our own God. And yet, without Christ's death, there could be no promise of resurrection and no grace. Grace is, I think, the greatest thing that exists, excepting God. But we only got it through the worst act of evil that was ever done. So, at the very core of Christianity, we see God performing jujitsu moves where he takes what is evil And rather than just abolishing it or undoing it, he twists it around and uses it for something greater than we could have ever imagined before. Who before Christ came could have conceived of grace? This unmakes evil and makes it powerless as the end result of evil and suffering is not then evil and suffering, but something greater and wonderful like grace. But I do think also this only happens if we let God do it. We can, and many people do, resist him when he tries to bring a greater good from a terrible evil. I don't know the exact reason why most instances of suffering occur. I and other people can probably say a great deal about the how of it, and there is some good value in the how, as I've already discussed. It's how much of science works, and it's used to minimize and eliminate most suffering. And in many cases, we can make a good guess on the whys, as I did in my own life, But unless God tells me, I cannot know the why of an instance of suffering for certain, especially somebody else's, and I really doubt anybody else can either. But what we do know is that in general, God undermines and emasculates evil as he continuously uses great suffering to bring about even greater goods. It's how we get grace. Very easy example, almost every popular and inspiring story involves someone enduring suffering. There is value in the suffering, and it seems we cannot suffer without evil being done to us. And the fact that movie theaters are filled with people watching films about heroes who suffer and sacrifice for the greater good shows that we all intrinsically know this is true. This is a difficult thing to quantify, but if you've ever met someone who suffered greatly and endured, you can just see that in them. It's like the Jewish saying, the man who hasn't suffered, what could he know? So, to conclude here... It's very important when you're looking at evil and how to deal with it to remember the how-why distinction. We can nearly always know the how, but the why is what we often really, really want, and it's very elusive and difficult to know. It's very foolish to think there's only one answer or reason for every instance of evil and suffering, as we would never look at any other area of inquiry like that. And with Christianity, we have an overall answer that God twists and undermines evil by using it to enable greater goods than were ever possible before. Now, of course, there's a whole lot more that could and should be said about this subject, and this is only the briefest of surveys with my own uh, ideas and reflections.
Evil and suffering is a very difficult thing to answer and explain, but the explanation of God undermining, emasculating, and eventually eliminating evil is at the very heart of Christianity, and it's the most compelling and useful answer that I've ever found. The more I've studied it, and this is the chief question that brought me into philosophy, the more convinced I've become that the God of Christianity not only does exist, but that he is looking out for us. And I've also come to see that it's like the quote I read from C.S. Lewis at the start. When, when we suffer, and every one of us is going to suffer, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the love of God more than all. So, um, so further resources on this. The three best books I've read on this subject are Making Sense of Suffering by Peter Kreeft, The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, and God, Freedom, and Evil by Alvin Plantinga. Now, Plantinga's book is highly academic and difficult to read, but that's where he made that extremely compelling case that d completely destroyed the logical problem of evil. Making Sense of Suffering and the Problem of Pain are quite a bit more accessible and very much worth your effort. In fact, uh, one thing I like about Kreef's book is that he incorporates the sense of having a story in your life into that book, and I haven't read any other philosophers who try to answer evil in that way. So since that's uh, really pushing my time, I'm just going to finish up there. So, do you agree? Disagree? Do you think any of this works? Do you think it's all garbage and I just haven't really dealt with any of it and whatnot? Well, send me some feedback. Let me know. You know, I'm, I'm happy to get your emails and see what you all think about what I just said. And, you know, give me some suggestions for other topics I should talk about. Hope to hear from you guys and I'll talk to you again next week. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.